So please welcome, give a very warm welcome to one of the true supporters of this industry, Jim Maisano. How am I going to measure up to that speech? This is going to be pretty hard. Um, I hope I can. Anyway, um, thank you, Albert. Um, I know Albert a long time since he's been lobbying us to the Board of Legislators. I am one of the old timers. I got elected not when I was 16, but 33. Um, and I'm still there at 52. Um, and it's been one of the greatest experiences of my life. I really love public service. I love being a county legislator. Um, I've been there for two different county executives and lots of different boards of legislators. And it's been a, a great run, you know. And I think one of the reasons I survived so long is some of the things Albert told you is that, you know, I happen to be a Republican, but I, one line I always say is I didn't go in politics to make the Republican Party look good. I went to politics to make Westchester look good. I went to politics to make New Rochelle and Pelham, where I represent, look good. And I wish more people had that attitude because I don't think I have to tell any of you, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, you know, you turn on Fox News or MSNBC, you can't even believe where our debate is facing our country right now. Um, people are ready to throw bombs at each other on a regular basis. And, you know, government only works when you do it in a professional, collegial, serious, thoughtful way. That's the only way government can happen. And um, that's one of the great success stories in our county. You know, we started having that go on on the Westchester County Board of Legislators. Again, I'm there 18 years, so I've seen a lot. And uh, for years, we didn't have it. Um, back in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, we had Republicans and Democrats, but we did a pretty good job of having collegiality um, and professionalism and holding down the partisanship. Um, when Rob Astorino came in, a few legislators decided that it was time to be p partisan and political all the time. And that was unfortunate. You can't do business that way. I think I can say that to this crowd. You know, when people are throwing political bombs left and right, you can't do business. And as a legislator, you just want to do your job. And you want to do it well. And um, then it was on both sides. You know, some both sides, I remember, you know, one morning you'd wake up with this really vicious attack press release from the Democrat, and then the Republican get a vicious attack press release back uh, against them. And you can't do business that way. It's ridiculous. So I don't know if you remember, but there was a budget about three years ago where um, the part, there was a really big partisan bickering between my good friend Ken Jenkins and my good friend Rob Astorino. Uh, Ken was the chair of the board, Astorino is the county executive, as you all know. And it was really out of control. I mean, press release every five minutes, attacking each other, people saying horrible things about each other. So a couple of Democrats came over to the Republicans and said, um, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. We have to do the budget in a more serious way. It can't be all political. So when the budget happened, you know, when we do the budget, it's like a big thing. It's like all day. It's a, it's, it's a month to the actual budget vote day. It's a lot of work. So one time the legislators really earned their pay. And when we showed up, there were, uh, at that point, there was um, 10 uh, Democrats and seven Republicans. But two Democrats joined us to put a bipartisan coalition together for that particular budget. There was no plans beyond that. A uh, bipartisan group to do the budget. And it was one of the most, I, no doubt, I'm never going to have a moment like this again in my life. I don't know if you remember, it was all over the news. Um, uh, they didn't, the Democrats, you know, my friends in this aisle, didn't realize at first that we had nine votes and they didn't. Nine out of 17 happens to be the majority. You control the floor. So uh, as I got up to present the alternative budget, not the budget that they were pushing, uh, they tried to adjourn the meeting, they did it illegally, and then uh, eight Democratic legislators stormed out of the chambers. I don't know if you remember all this. It was all over the news. They stormed out of the chambers, and the other rest of us were just standing at our desks like, what do we do now? Eight of our colleagues just stormed out. Um, I, I was the minority leader at the time, the Republican leader, and I have a pretty good grasp of Robert's rules. I am a trial lawyer, and I, I understand legislation pretty well, so I knew that they, that they didn't adjourn it uh, properly, so I stood up. Uh, it's my great moment of my 15 minutes of fame. You get it once, I guess. And I said, uh, as they were walking out, get back in your chairs. Uh, you must fulfill your oath to the taxpayers. This is a legal ending of the meeting. This meeting is ongoing. If you walk out, we're going to continue the meeting without you. And they kept walking. So nine legislators did the budget all by themselves. Seven, Demo seven Republicans and two Democrats. Um, but it was a circus. It was a circus because as we're doing the budget, 
the leadership that was now out of the room turn off the lights. They had the staff leave so we didn't have a clerk. I mean, this is like uh, something in a third world nation, right? This is like a, you know, a coup in Nicaragua or something. Um, they um, took out the cameraman. They took out so there'd be no record of the meeting, trying to stop us from going forward. But I told you I'm a pretty good trial lawyer. I, had, I anticipated they were going to do that. I brought my own cameraman. And I had someone standing there with a camera ready to go because I had a feeling they were going to do this. Uh, number one. Number two, we had, we had trained other staff people to be, go step into the clerk role and deputy clerk role immediately once they left the room. So we were like clockwork. We, uh, I was elected the acting chair. Uh, we did a very responsible bipartisan budget uh, that held the line on taxes, protected essential services. Um, only nine legislators with the lights out, with the lights out, and worst of all, there's a bong that goes off. You ever might have heard it if you ever been to the board of legislators? It goes bomb, bomb, bomb. That's to call us into chambers. They put it on for the entire meeting. <laughs> this is that. This is what. This is. If you wonder why there's a bipartisan coalition and why a couple of Democrats broke away from their colleagues, that's why. Um, so we did the budget that time. Uh, they sued and lost. Everything we did was proper and legal, and that started. Um, a great phase for the Board of Legislators because we, from that moment, the nine of us stuck together and then more Democrats joined us. Uh, and we grew the coalition. And right now you have in Westchester County a true bipartisan coalition government. A chairman is a Democrat, Mike Kapwitz. I'm the vice chairman. Every legislator chairs a committee. Everybody's got skin in the game. Everybody's involved in the running of the board. Um, uh, all the decisions are made in a teamwork approach, in a leadership meeting, uh, and amongst the legislators. And if you notice, we're really boring for the last three years. You don't have all this crazy press you had a few years ago because we're not throwing bombs at each other. We're working together. Uh, and what does that mean, for instance? Um, one of the things the uh, prior leadership was doing was blocking bonds. They were blocking bonding. Now, you're all business people, and I imagine you think it's a good idea. Uh, for us to pass the bonds that are uh, that we have uh, that are coming down from the county executive to rebuild our infrastructure in Westchester, right? Everybody, everybody says they're for rebuilding the infrastructure. Well, they were trying to hold the bonds hostage to get other things from the county executive. Again, that's bad government. You pass the bonds because they're the right thing to do, and you don't hold them hostage. Well, in two years, our bipartisan coalition passed 250 million dollars in infrastructure bonds to help Westchester's economy. And I think that's critically important. Um, there were bonds that were being held up for no reason but pure partisanship. And that money is now going to contractors that are doing work around the county, stuff that was part of the long-term uh, capital program. Building roads, maintaining infrastructure, bridges, sewage treatment plant, county airport, other county facilities, and critical to our economy. So not only is bipartisanship the right thing to do, it works. It works really well. Um, Another thing that we've done well in the last five years in the Board of Legislators, as you probably all know, is uh, we haven't raised property taxes in five years. Um, and that wasn't easy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not easy. Um, now, I will say this. In, when Rob Astorino came in, the first two or three years, the budget had been so bloated when he got there, it wasn't that hard to cut. To be blunt with you. I mean, there was so much fat in the budget, it was kind of easy. But now we're in the fifth year of cutting, and all the low-hanging fruit is gone, uh, and it's getting a lot harder now to do the budget without raising taxes, and I don't know what's going to happen this year. Uh, if, you, if the budget comes out November 15th, um, we have a, a 45 days to do the budget. I think it actually might come out November 10th this year on an agreement we have to get it five days earlier. But nevertheless, after election day, the budget comes out. Our goal is not to raise taxes, uh, but we're looking at a pretty serious hole in the county budget. You're going to be seeing articles in the paper about this. It's going to be rough. Um, you know, our revenues just haven't gone up since the market crash in 2008. What, if you ask me what funds the county government, it is property taxes, it is sales tax, it is state and federal aid. Right? Those are the drivers of our county budget. State and federal aid have decreased since the market crashed. The sales tax has stayed flat in some years or decreased, and we haven't raised property taxes. So there's, you're all business people. There's your cash flow. All right? Um, so we've been reducing the budget, mostly by attrition, by not filling vacant positions. So you don't really want to lay off people 
and really hurt a family. So we've done it by attrition. Uh, the workforce, I had a note here somewhere for myself, of how much we reduced uh, the workforce in Westchester. Oh, we, we had, um, when Rob Astorino took office in 2010, there were 4,870 county employees. Uh, we've got that down to 4,228, a 15% drop. And we did that by attrition so we didn't hurt people. And I thought that's really important. But my point is, as we made those cuts, it made it harder to deliver the services that we have to do. And um, if we, you know, the estimates that are out right now that it would take another 400 layoffs this year, uh, and now these are layoffs, not attrition, if um, we were going to balance the budget because our revenues are so down. That's scary stuff. We don't want to, we're not going to lay off 400 people. That's not going to happen. But we have a very, very hard budget. 50 to 60 percent of our budget is mandated by the state or the federal government. Um, you know, we have a department like social services that's mandated. It's $312 million. It's an enormous sum of money. Um, you know, the biggest cost to us is employees. And if I had a chart here, which I don't, but if you looked at the pension costs for our employees, the medical benefit costs, everything, the chart's going this way. So, it were, this, this, I think, in the five years since Rob Astor, Astorino came in, had very good intentions uh, to hold the line on property taxes and continue to reduce spending. I think this is going to be our greatest test uh, to do it without raising taxes. So maybe there'll be a 1% tax increase this year. I don't know if we'll make it another year because we have to fund the government properly and we can't do it uh, with fiscal gimmick, gimmickry or, or, or tricks. We've got to do a real budget uh, that, that the rating agencies properly uh, give us the credit for. So I think this budget you're going to hear about in November, December is going to be really tough and maybe ugly because the county executive says he's going to send down a budget that's not going to raise taxes and some of us don't know if that's possible. You give him a chance, it's his job, right? They, I don't know if you know the process. The county executive sends the budget down in November and then it's the board of legislators that has the budget and we work on the budget and we have it for three, four weeks and we'll see what the county executive sends us. I, I joke with him all the time, I wish him well. I hope he sends a great budget down that doesn't raise taxes and is truly balanced without any unfunded, you know, unfunded uh, tricks in the budget. So uh, one, one shots, as they call them, you know, you grab money out of one pool of funds just to plug the hole in one year's budget. Uh, that's fiscally irresponsible, you can't do that either. So anyway, I'm giving you the preview. The articles are not gonna be great in November, December. We're gonna have a very, very hard budget. So the good news is we're working well together, bipartisanship. Um, we're, we're in an election right now. I don't know if the coalition survives. Uh, of the nine legislators that are the core of the coalition, a couple other legislators have joined us as well. Uh, some of them are getting elections this year against them because uh, some of the more political side, the Democrat side, want to knock out the coalition. So I don't know what happens on election day. You'll find out, as I will. Um, but I really, really hope the coalition continues. There's no doubt in my mind, having been there for 18 years, that this Board of Legislators works best when it's done with collegiality, professionalism, seriousness, and bipartisanship. And it works worse when people are acting like it's Washington, D.C. So I feel good about that. We'll see uh, if all the legislators in our coalition continue. I'd like to be the vice chairman for another two years. I love the job. Had a great time working with my friend Mike Kaplowitz. Um, and we, have, we still have a lot of work to do. So I think this would work a lot better if you're not listening to me, but I imagine you have questions. I imagine you have things you want to know about the county government. I think it would be best if um, uh, I take your questions and try to explain things as much as possible. Uh, on that point, uh, now we, we, we have rules for questions. You, uh, when, you're, when you're acknowledged, you get up, you articulate, like this, uh, 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 and, and you state who you are, if you want to state where you're from, and then uh, give us your question. We don't need a long statement, but a question, and we'll take it from there. All right, so who has a question? Carl Mullen. And Mr. Mullen has the mic. Jim, would it be better for you to work on the budget in the dark? You seem to do much better than the <laughs> Maybe. Maybe it's not a bad idea with the, with the bong going off at the same time. Absolutely. It sounds like you do a good job that way, and I think maybe you should try it in the future. All right. Well, I'll talk to my colleagues about that. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. All right. We call that question light. Okay, next. I hope they're all that easy. Uh, did, you get, did you get question light? about working in the dark? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 and you know, the room, the room is kind of small, so I think if you just get up and, uh, and, and just project, as we say in acting class, you'll be okay. Just identify yourself and, and, and give your question. Yes, did you have a question? Does somebody raise their hand here? Any other questions? 
Oh my lord, there's got to be a, a, a couple of questions out there. Who's going to win the match? Well, I've been All right. All right, so I'm Lewis Bach. I'm from Yonkers originally. I live in East Chester. Uh, my question for you is, uh, when you're looking at the, the previous decade or so and the, uh, the regulations uh, put around rental real estate and, and around property management that directly affects a lot of folks in this room, do you think that we're going to experience an increase in, in that kind of uh, attitude in, in Westchester County over the next five years? Or do you think it would be about the same or, or less than that? Well, you know, the majority of the laws that regulate your industry come out of the state, not the county legislature. Okay. Uh, but there are some laws that are starting to pop up. I was waiting for that question, Albert. I thought if someone was going to ask me about that question. I mean, there are legislators introducing uh, legislation relating to uh, co-op boards uh, and when they, how they reject somebody. Uh, full disclosure, they wanted the rejection placed in writing. I imagine you all know about this. I know the co-op boards in my district do. They've called me uh, to talk about it. Um, uh, another piece of legislation that's floating around is that there'll be a time frame uh, from when the co-op board application goes in to the board makes its decision of about 45 days. So those two are pending before the Board of Legislators. Are you familiar with those two pieces of legislation? Um, so, so far we've blocked them, so far. Um, I think a majority of legislators at this point wasn't comfortable in passing either of those pieces of legislation. Um, the co-op boards, I think, uh, have been very influential in reaching out to their legislators explaining how important it is not to give up that right for them to make their decision uh, to decide who comes to live in that particular building. Um, and it's been this way for decades. Um, and this is their way to uh, maybe stop someone that wouldn't be a good tenant uh, to come into the building, uh, or a good owner. Um, so at this point, the proponents of that law have not been successful to get nine out of 17 to pass the full disclosure. The second piece of that law and I'm not quite sure if they're together or separate, but I'm going to view them as separate. I think there probably is more than nine voters that would vote for the 45-day timeline, that when the co-op board gets the application, they have 45 days to make a decision. There's probably more than nine legislators to vote for that piece. Um, as I was telling Caesar uh, before, uh, when I was sitting there, uh, it's kind of interesting that, you know, maybe we'll just pass that and push away the full disclosures. Uh, to, not, it's not going to happen. I imagine most people in this room don't want that to happen, the full disclosure. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a real estate lawyer. You know, I, uh, uh, I, understand, I understand all the problems that are inherent about doing the full disclosure in writing to co-op boards. I think uh, I'm not going to vote for that. Um, and I, I'm, I've been advocating to my colleagues to block it. So I'll keep doing the best I can on that legislation. Uh, Caesar. Hail Caesar. Caesar Manfredi, half co-op in Irvington. Um, New York City generally passes some things that affects co-ops and then Westchester comes along. Recently they passed uh, a future ban on number six oil. It, it, is there something pending? Because a lot of the older co-ops do use number six and it involves a possible conversion to gas or getting rid of number six. And of course if you get rid of number six and you have to go to number two, uh, Carlos Torres will come after you for uh, bulk storage regulations that go into effect for two. That yeah, the, um, that legislation that passed, I think, is it. I don't think we're going forward anytime soon. Uh, that legislation had a sliding scale, so the law changes over time. So I don't think it's going to be revisited at any time. I mean, that's the law. And for the, I think for the current crop of legislators, I don't see another, that law changing anytime soon. Uh, Nat. By Nat Barish. Um, is the Board of Legislators doing anything about trying to mediate and settle this hot ass uh, war? Well, we tried. It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because I was going to put that in my... Oh, sure. I will. I will. I'll repeat the question. Well, I'll just give a, uh, I'll give a ex explanation of the question. Uh, as many of you knew, know, back in 2009, the county of Westchester settled a lawsuit with HUD um, over... Uh, ironically, everybody calls it the desegregation lawsuit. I find that even the reporters write in the paper that they settled the desegregation lawsuit. Uh, right? Is that, is that you see that in the papers when you read about the HUD lawsuit? It's not a desegregation lawsuit. It wasn't. It was a false claims act. 
This is so funny that the reporters don't even know what they're saying. I was a legislator at that time, and I know exactly what the case was about. We were sued for false claims, that when the county put uh, the community development block grant application to the to federal government, HUD, uh, they made a false claim that they didn't include all the necessary paperwork that, that you need to uh, for the claim for the uh, proposal, and that you had to ex ex uh, assess um, uh, affirmatively advancing fair housing in Westchester County, and that we didn't do all the pieces of that analysis when we asked for the federal funds, so we filed a false claim. So it's really not was not a desegregation case. But when they settled, the settlement, as you probably all know, was Westchester agreed to build 750, uh, 700, uh, 750 units across Westchester County over about seven years, all right? And we have benchmarks every year uh, that we have to hit. And uh, we were, you know, it's the uh, same, con I said, for low-hanging fruits. We had a lot of developers come forward at the beginning to build the uh, affordable housing and help us get to the 750. But now that we're in the 400-500 range and we're trying to get to the 750 to end this, we're getting less and less applications for housing development. So um, I'm really nervous about this because we have to build, we have to hit the benchmark so we can be fined by the federal government. Um, so that's where your question comes in great. This gentleman asked, are we trying to settle the case? Well, let me tell you briefly what happened when we tried to settle. So the county executive was on one stream saying, we're building the housing, that's that. We fought, we've given you everything you want by now. HUD was saying, you haven't given us everything we want. Your application, your paperwork's not acceptable. Two extremes, your point, two extremes. Well, Michael Kapwitz and I and some other legislators actually uh, did a series of conference calls and meetings with HUD say, how do we settle this, right? This was a, I mean, if, 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 I know everybody likes to make fun of the government, so at least this time we can make fun of the federal government. Let me tell you what happened. We met with the HUD regional director here in New York metropolitan area that covered Westchester, and we thought we worked out a settlement. This is the board of legislators. And I gotta tell you, this wasn't easy because uh, the county executive was upset that we were kind of going around his back trying to reach a settlement. Um, but I did think it, that rather than this continued lawsuit, acrimony, there was a way we could settle it that wasn't so bad, that wasn't a bad path. So I was at least willing to go through the conversation with them. So we thought we reached a settlement. And we went back to the legislators trying to put together the nine votes necessarily to pass the compromise. What happened? As we're trying to line up the votes, I think we needed 12 because we had because the county executive was going to override the compromise. We were going to veto the compromise. So we needed 12 votes. As we tried to get to 12, we get a letter from HUD in Washington, D.C. saying, uh, we've, we've looked at your application for the compromise. Uh, it's rejected. Um, and here's all the problems with the settlement. So one person in HUD settled with us uh, in the New York metropolitan area. And then some bureaucrat in Washington, some lawyer, told us that the settlement was rejected with all these new mandates, all these new things. At that point, we gave up because it was, uh, it was almost comical at this point. We had reached a settlement, both sides gave in. It was a real compromise. I thought it was gonna happen, but then some lawyer in Washington, D.C. blew it up, which kind of made, I mean, I, when Astorino complains about them, I understood better at that moment when you could be told one by a lawyer represents HUD in New York metropolitan area and settle with them. All of you guys, uh, uh, all of you have been in business. I imagine you settled lawsuits in your time, right? You know, could you imagine, you know when you get to the table and you settle the lawsuit, and then can you imagine HUD walking in and just blowing it up? That's what happened. So they, I, I feel like Michael Kaplitz and I, the leaders of the Board of Legislators, in good faith, tried to settle with HUD, and I, I believe they screwed it up. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. Well, did you ever consider going to Senator Schumer and Senator Gilbrand and ask them on your behalf, on behalf of the legislature to push HUD to agree to a settlement? Because after all, and you know, the politics of this are obvious. And if they were to say, hey, because after all, there's a whole bunch of communities, forgetting about Astorino and all that, a whole bunch of communities are being denied money for, as you pointed out, good purposes, because of this nonsense the argument about some language in a report that, you know, you could really write anything, it won't matter. But it's a, whatever it is, it just seems to me that there's some language thing that if there was an intervention, by the senators with the legislature's approval, leaving the politi other politicians out of it, that perhaps we could have an end to it. Great question. Did you hear it in the back? Because I, I wouldn't ask Jim Mizano to repeat that. 
I will, I will quickly say this. Did we reach out to our senators and Congress members to help us on the settlement? Yes. As a matter of fact, they were instrumental in getting the original settlement, uh, particularly Nita Lowy and Elliot Engel. Both of them intervened in a very helpful way and helped them get that original settlement. I will tell you that even they threw up their hands uh, when HUD came back and blew up the settlement. Um, and by the way, when the, when the HUD lawyer from D.C. sent the letter rejecting the settlement, it, was, uh, it wasn't like on the margins. She blew up most of the major terms of the settlement. So there was nowhere to go at that point. So I will say that we did get help from um, the senators were engaged, but in particular the Congress members gave us the most help. We have time for uh, just another question or two. Uh, anybody else? I would, I would like to say uh, on the point of how helpful Jim has been over the years, you know, most, uh, most times you don't um, associate uh, Republicans with being active uh, on the organized labor front. And yet, uh, over the years, especially at times when we've had some serious disagreements with, uh, with SEIU Local 32 BJ, uh, of all the legislators, it has been Jim Maizano to get uh, the uh, parties together and just to talk. And uh, in that, again, in that spirit of discussion, compromise, and, and, and good communication amongst various disparate parties. So, uh, so again, it underscores the fact that, uh, that um, uh, he's one of the few legislators who has really been uh, key legislators in the position of, of power and influence has been very helpful to us. So if there are no other questions, uh, we have one other question. Uh, stand, yes. articulate, yes. emote. As far as Neil and, and interest of Mount Vernon in Westchester County, one of the things I feel, I hear you about taxes, and I understand the need for raising funds, but I think it's very important, it's not a question, I'd rather place it as a statement. I feel that with the rising cost of energy, water, uh, with the rising or non-payment of our tenants at times, we are carrying a society that is part of our Westchester County. And I do feel that whatever you and your legislators and boards can look at us as units in condominiums and rentals, apartments, owners, uh, we really need to not be submerged with extra taxes. Thank you. Good. Well, I agree. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I have a pretty good record on property taxes. I've been there, uh, eight, this is my 18th budget, and I voted against every property tax increase, and I voted for every property tax decrease. Uh, so I have a pretty good record. However, with that said, after I boasted about my record, um, this year I'm very concerned whether we can do it again. We've gutted, you know, we've, we've really cut, some might say gutted, the county services after five straight years of significant cutting so we didn't have to raise taxes. That we're at a point now, we've cut some of the departments so far down, it's getting harder and harder to deliver the services. The planning department, the parks department, you know, they're like in half. They're like half the employees they used to have. So, um, you know, my, my major point is, when we do budgeting, it's got to be real. You know, these one shots or sneaking money out of one fund and moving it around just so you can balance the budget. I mean, that's phony. That's not real. And the rating agencies hate it. And we have a AAA bond rating in Westchester County, which means we can borrow at the lowest cost possible. They're, they've been threatening us that uh, because we haven't raised taxes, those revenues aren't coming in, uh, that if our budgets are truly uh, uh, balanced, and if we borrow for operating costs, which is a no-no, in, in the governmental accounting, uh, that they're going to reduce our bond rating. So we're at a really tough place this year, where we've got to do a balanced, real budget and not raise taxes. I don't think we're going to raise taxes 2 3%. But is it possible, if the budget's as bad as I think, that we do like 1%? Maybe. But I, I don't think there'd be a tax increase anything beyond that. Uh, one more question, then in deference to uh, the Mets fans in the audience, we want to wrap it up. I'm a Mets fan. Uh, uh, so, so in deference to the I didn't know that, but I'm a Yankees fan, but in deference to the Mets fans, God bless them. But can I just say, I'm so nervous about this game, oh. I'm glad I'm here. I'll be too home, I'll be a nervous wreck watching it home. See, it's just the in there, we're going to follow up in the last one. Nothing. Up, one nothing. Mets are up, one nothing. There was legislation pending, I believe, the county, certainly at the town, was taxing condos like houses. Uh, the Homestead Act. Yes. Was that in the county also? No, it's up in the state legislature. Okay, so the county doesn't do We're not, it's not before us. Okay. 
No, state legislature. In that case, in that case, Jim, what, what, on any particular issue, uh, if, the, if the legislators were approached to give Albany a, a, a uh, I don't know what the legal term is, whatever, a, a, a unified letter of, of uh, support or of call them resolutions. Resolution. Uh, in support of or uh, uh, opposition to something like that, 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 that's possible, right? Yes. I don't mean we got to get a majority. Right, right, right. But it's possible. All right, folks, listen, please give me, uh, Mr. Maizano a, a big hand. Thank you. I just said one thing, Albert. I just want to say, you know, if you have questions about the county government when you leave here tonight, you don't have to be shy. You know, call any time. Well, if you have a question about a particular piece of legislation like Caesar just did, or what's going on at the board, or you think we're doing something wrong, you should feel free to call us. Uh, Write this number down because I know it by heart. 995-2800. That's the number to get you. That's the switchboard at the board. You get all 17 legislators there. And you can ask for your legislator. You can ask for Jim. 995-2800. And that's the, the switchboard number where you can then access your own legislator as well as Jim or anybody else. I like what people call. It's interesting. You know, even when the people disagree with me. It's actually fun. This is my job. And if nobody ever calls me, it gets kind of boring. So if you have a question, you have a comment, call anytime. On that note, on that positive note, God willing, see you at the November General Membership Meeting. We've got a great program again, Operation Backbone, a worthy cause. And uh, safe home tonight, and uh, see you all soon. Thanks for coming. Let's go, Mets.